Dr. Siegel and I came up with an idea. Well, I mean, I had an idea. She kind of had a suggestion. But then, That's Temple Consult. Good. Yeah. Easy. I actually enjoy it. Like, yes. I like the yeah. neuro uh, consults. Hey, did you guys know that on the Pima Neuro website, there is a Temple attending job posting? I wonder if it replaces Ocular. Nah. You can bring Reed in, probably. But, like, they describe the job exactly like what he's doing now. Really? Like, doing temple console, take a portion of temple invasion bed. <laughs> so, I'm not sure if they move him to do more research. Yeah, they should. And then just. That's what he's good at. Because I think last year he, like, picking up classes to teach in medical school. So I was like, why are you taking class teaching classes in medical school? Mm. So I kind of wondering about that. So now I like I saw the ad I'm like, oh, uh oh, maybe they move him to research and they hire somebody else. Because the job is exactly what why he's are you doing. The temple job? <laughs> Sometimes you get bored, you don't know what to do, and you're like, what should you do? Yeah, should I do fellowship or should I just get a oh, job? You know, like it's not always happened like that. Did you have that feeling? Like, what should I do now? Yeah, no, definitely, especially this fall. Yeah. So you're still trying to figure out what you want to do? Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Drew says good things about him. Who? Cruz. Oh, that's nice of him. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we're Asian. Is that it? You're in the club? <laughs> I don't know. Where did you learn from? In the January. In the January? Oh, it's around there. The SAE. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'll get the TBI portion of the SAE done. <laughs> that's good, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You got it, baby. Yeah. 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 Like, uh, I want to get it done. Seriously. Yeah. Last year, I think it was full of Really? I'm so glad. Although having the baby, I think, makes me even more apt to not do anything like that. Yeah. And like, the whole dude is soft. You have that baby on until April and May, like, almost out of the end. Oh, uh, so you kind of want to do At the end of the year, like, oh, I will with you. Yeah. I think we should get it done. At the end of the year, you would have already quit the Uh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it's portable. I love too. Yeah, I keep Yeah, he's got biceps. Okay, uh, okay, so okay. he's getting stronger. He's he was a high nurse, but the nurses feel like he can do more than he got. So he needs some extra spell on top of spell. Like they're like he's in there like holding his cell phone up to his ear, but he'll make us help him certain like moving face. Like he's got his yeah. 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 really still weak. So like yeah. 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 the big thing is, you know. Yeah, well, and they were talking about like, that motion he can do. Dr. Shane and I were telling me, like, this motion, which he can do, is not a very good feeding one. Like, if you get cereal in a spoon and you do this, you're going to dump it on yourself. It's this part that he has a hard time with. Uh, but he's definitely getting stronger. Uh, he was doing a trial board yesterday. James didn't get any calls or anything, so hopefully he's going to yeah, which he for a day refused to take. He's like, ah, oh, I'm not having fever in my blood for a year. I'm just trying to link it up and get it. So we're fine, right? Yeah, we're like, we're like, this is a little different than just your run of the mill. And, and, yeah, and he made his call, so his ID now is personal friends. And he's like, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. He's like, yes. Thank you. Yeah. So he's back on the other side. He only missed one day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hey, you guys want to play with the Broad Street Tavern? Yeah, you leave. Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you see that? Did you Let's see if there's a 
Okay. Let's do this. Oh, okay. All right, let's get started. This is Cora talking about blockchain line talks. All right, so um, I worked this project with Dr. Moon for the past month. Unfortunately, he's not here today. He's on vacation somewhere. So um, the goals of the talk is to talk about different techniques in terms of delivering Botox and spastic muscles. For the first few minutes of the talk, I will go through very briefly about post-stroke spasticity because a lot of us already know about this. So I won't go into details about uh, the definitions and the management. I don't go through that. The focus is to talk about Botox and different injections. So spasticity, Dr. Uh, Mayer told us yesterday, last week that it's velocity dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes or exaggerated victim's reflex. Of course, it's come from the upper motor neuron lesions such as MS, spinal cord, or TBI. The incidence of post-stroke spasticity can range from 17% up to 40%. Um, a lot of severe cases is about 10%. Of course, it can cause pain, difficulty with dressing, grooming, and ADLs. In some cases, it helps you with standing or walking. Uh, the modified Ashworth score and the Tadu scale are the two most commonly used assessment methods. So I won't go through these scales. As here for your references, I included Bethel Index because a couple of research later on talk about it. It's just an ADL questionnaire. It go up to 100 as its highest score. Um, so in order to understand a couple of research that I will speak later on, it's important to understand some common upper, upper limb spastic postures. As you can see on their left figure with the bent wrist, when you have a patient like that, you should know that the most two common muscles involved is a flexor copy radialis or flexor copy onerus with their closed fist. The second and the third digit, you can see that the PIP joint is affected, which is the FDS. And the fourth and fifth digit, you can see the DIP joint is involved, which is mainly the FDP. And the last picture showed that the flexed elbow, uh, mainly the bicep, the brachioradialis or brachialis muscles are involved. Uh, next one is a common lower limb spastic postures. So on the far left picture, you can see the adductor tone, very hyperactive. And the third and the fourth picture, you can see the foot is a little bit ankle inversion. So the tibialis posterior is um, very active in this picture. And also the big toes is extended up. So you know that extends to how it's longest. And a lot of times the most common lower limb spastic posture is the plantar flexion, usually involving the gastrocnemius muscles and also the soleus. So the management of spasticity, we all know about this. It's involving oral medication. Uh, most of it rotate through stroke or spinal cord injury. We know the baclofen, neurontin, uh, dentroline, tozenidine to treat uh, spasticity. But in a lot of cases, those medication can cause a lot of side effects such as sedation, dry mouth. Um, so Botox or fentanyl injections are the next treatment. Um, one thing I want to point out is that the effectiveness of Botox and spasticity is the twofold. You see a lot of people talk about Botox to reduce spasticity tone. However, the improvement in motor function remain controversial. There's variable effect. It's not as good as decrease the tone. So why Botox fail in these cases? So things that you should look for, like, are you choose the right dose? Are you choose the right muscle to inject? Or when you choose the right muscle, do you have adequate injection technique? So that's the goal of the talk, is to look at different injection techniques to facilitate the delivery of Botox to the spastic muscles today. So here's the mechanisms of Botox. Dr. Moon did go through this. 
when he gave us the lecture for cervical dystonia a week ago. So just to remind you, Botox with a neuromuscular junction, uh, basically it's just blocking the, the docking protein um, to prevent the release of the Botox. So I listed on the table there the Botox type A, the different brand names in the United States and different brand names in the Europe, and Botox type B, different brand names in the United States and also in Europe. Um, so just look into the different um, guidance method in muscle localization. There's four different methods that will be discussed today. Number one is manual needle placement, which is I will shorten as MNP, electro Myography, I was shown as EMG. Electrical stimulation will be shown as ES and ultrasound. Um, there are two parts of the talk. The first part would just say which out of these four techniques will be the best to localize when you inject Botox. And the second part would say can we compare these methods and see which one will produce a better clinical outcome. So that's the two goals of the talk. So at the end of the talk, I would hope that uh, the audience can give me the answer to two questions. So if you have a stroke patient present to you with a flex wrist and clenched fist, what would be your number one instrumental technique for injecting Botox and why? And hopefully you can get that during the lecture today. The second question, if you're like Dr. Hurd, could be late for seeing his patient. So you have a busy office schedule, you're late seeing patient, and he decided to use manual needle placement so what muscle would be the best if he decided to use MNP technique? All right, so it hurt, listen. <laughs> so let's look at part one. The part one, so first of all, we talk about manual needle placement. So as you can see that manual needle placement is a very quick and fast approach. You don't need any equipment at all. You just need the palpation, you need your good hand. So as you can see in the pictures I show it here, is the needle gastrocnemius. The thing about this technique is you, the patient had to lay or had to be positioned in anatomical position. So the knee had to be extended and you palpate for the medial femoral conduct, such as in the medial gastro, and you draw a line and you use the hand breath method and to find the optimal site of injection, which is the muscle bulk. That's what the manual needle placement. So advantages, as I said, is fast. You don't have to use E, um, EMG needle to poke around and to find the, the point of injection, you just use the smaller needle to deliver the Botox. And it's good for children with cerebral palsy. They actually don't have to be worried or scary about the needles at all. Um, disadvantage. This method is not good for small, deeper, and overlapping muscles of the forearm. So if you have deep, overlapping muscles, you can feel However, in the patient like normal, like you and me, the anatomical landmark is obvious, but in patient with chronic strokes, the muscle become atrophy, hypertrophy, the anatomical landmark can be altered in these cases. So for in the deep overlapping muscles, this technique is not that great. So let's look at studies of Dr. Snitzler. Uh, it was done in German. Um, this study looked at 30 cadaver limbs uh, to evaluate ink injection into the gastrocnemius. One thing I like about this study is that they use a cohort of physicians. They use 121 physicians to do the study instead of using one physician to do all the injection. So that's a good thing about this study, 121 physicians. Out of those is 106 of phys physical medicine attending. Um, so in those groups, 30 had no experience of injecting at all, such as our second year, probably have no, uh, no experience of injecting Botox. And 91 physicians are regularly injecting Botox. They classify as a physician's group. <laughs> out, of those 20, out of those 91, 29 physicians have more than five years of experience. And about 22 physicians actually admit Botox injection like 15 a month. Out of those, 70 use electrical stimulation and about 20 people using manual needle placement. Um, so each physician is required to inject 1.5 ml ink into either the needle or the lateral head of the gastrocnemius. 
And there are two, phys two independent evaluators. One is anatomist and one is an orthopedic <laughs> surgeon to verify the accuracy of the, of the injection by dissection. So here, this is the overall result. The left picture shows you that the successful injection is only about 43% in the ink in the head of the gastrocnemius. Uh, I hope you can see that there's a little dot there, so it's a, the head of the gastroc. Unsuccessful injection is about 57%. Out of those, 37 is too deep, go into the soleus. And 20% is too superficial, it's going too fat. So let's look into details about what happened to all different groups. For the naive group, which is a 30 physician have no experience of injecting, the success rate, as you can see, 17%. The failure rate is about 30. But if you, this, they're not really different. If you look at experts in terms of years of practice, the success is only about 26%. And the failure here is about also the same thing, 38%. Compared to experts in terms of number of injection, 21 success rate and 27%. So there's no major differences in terms of clinical, how long they've been in practice. It's actually the failure rate and the success rate is almost equal. Why is that? So they said that probably because of the use of the cadaver versus real patients, because remember, 70 physicians using electrical stimulation to deliver Botox. So these physicians rely on their visual skill, the auditory skill, the palpation skill in the real life patient to to have the accurate injection. In the cadaver, you don't have that tone that you have in the real patient. So these real life physicians, they struggle in the cadaver patient. That's one of explanation. And second limitation is that two different evaluators, they may have different guidelines in terms of which one consider accurate. So what the conclusion is that even for large superficial muscles such as gastrocnemia, muscle palpation, and not and anatomical lemma are insufficient to ensure the accuracy of Botox injection. So the next study we look for is, uh, we look at today is doc, by Dr. Pacelli. He's a physician in um, Italy. The study was done in the upper limb spasticity. So they selected 41 patients, chronic stroke, at least about more than two years from the stroke and they injecting the Botox into four different forearm muscles, the flexor carpi radialis, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor uterum, the FDS and FDP, and I including the occlusion criteria, they exclude all the patients with fixed contractures or any bony deformities in the affected upper limbs or any previous surgery in that limbs, or even phenol injection was also excluded. Um, they verify the accuracy of these injections and also the muscle thickness by the use of ultrasound. So what did they find? So they find that the accuracy, the overall accuracy of manual needle placement into the spastic forearm muscle is about 51%, <clears throat> only 51%. Into the wrist flexor, which is the FCRs and FCU, is only about 36 to 40% in the wrist flexor. In the finger flexor is about higher in the 60%. Why is that? The why there's such a discrepancy between if you inject in the wrist flexor, you actually lower than the finger flexor. They found that the muscle thickness verified by ultrasound was actually higher for the finger flexor. It's about one centimeter higher, 1.58 centimeter in the finger flexor versus the wrist flexor only 0.49 centimeter. And if you go through EMG with Dr. Shihara, he's always said the FCR very superficial, very superficial, very thin. You need to be careful because that muscle is thin compared to the FDS and FDP. Um, it's, it's thicker because, again, they have four fascicles on, on each of them. So what their conclusion is that for patients with spastic wrist and clenched fist, maybe you should use some instrumental guidance to, to help you targeting the Botox accurately. The limitation of the study, again, is small sample size, only 41 patients. And again, as I said, they did not attempt to choose any specific fascicles of the FDS of FDP. That could lead to the overestimate 
of the needle placement into the finger flexors. So the next method we're going to look at today is the EMG guidance. As you can see that EMG, every single technique will start out with anatomical localizations. Um, so EMG, you can, I think a lot of second year may be having difficulty to understand about EMG because you're not going through that yet, but I will try my best to explain. EMG involving using the needle electrodes and insert into the specific spastic muscles of your interest until you hear the, what MUAP stands for, the motor unit action potential. Then you actually ask the patient to do some certain movement for you, like for the bicep, you ask them to contract or bending the, the elbows, and then you will hear the bust of all these MUAP imprints. Or if the patient cannot contract with you, you can just do passive range of motion, and you can see uh, the bust of MUAP. And you can see that some lab will have the screen, and you can see the MUAP on the screen. Some lab will just have the amplifier which is the physician will utilize using the audible, um, the auditory to help them to say, oh, I'm near the motor end plate, or I'm not near the motor end plate by the auditory skill that they have. Um, so the EMG is good that it assists the physician in delivering Botox near to the motor end plate, and that will help you increase the uptake of Botox into the nerve terminal. However, if you're taking, for example, this patient, they have both wrist flexors and they, uh, the both finger flexor spasticity, right? So all the four arms was a spastic. So the family would just tell you that, oh, doctor, I just want my son or my daughter able to open the hand to hold a can. So you know that you only need to target the FDS or FDP. You may not need to target the FCRs or FCU because that's not what they wanted. They just want the patient to open the hand. They were supposed to clean the hand. So in the case of if all the forearm muscles are spastic, how can EMG can tell you that you are in the FDS or the FDP? Because they all spastic. They all will sound the same. You can hear everything will sound like MUAP because it's all spastic. One needle in, you can say, am I in the FDS or FDP or am I in the FCR? Because again, EMG is blind and you rely on the auditory skill to say, oh, I'm near the motor end plate. But if all the muscles in that location where you're injecting is all spastic, you can't tell which one that you targeted. Are you following? Or, yeah. So if you want FDS only, but the FCR is also spastic, what if you're in the FCR? So, so again, that's one of the drawback of the EMG. Um, We'll look at one study, is Dr. Plumis. This study is really good. I think it's one of the best studies that I've read um, <laughs> compared to all the study we talked about today. This study is the only one that look at functional measure. No other study look at functional measure. This one look at the modified Bethel index. So they have 27 patients with spastic hemiplegia due to brain or spinal cord injury. They divide a patient into two groups, group A and group B. Group A is a 15 patient receiving Botox via EMG, and group B is receiving Botox via M uh, the manual needle placement alone. So I hope you can see this, but this, this is blurry. Basically, they just show that group A is the one on the left, and group B is on the right. They show you the pre-injection spasticity in the first column, and then three week post-injection. So for the EMG group, most of them like drop from three to one. For the group B, you see half and half. 50% drop to one, 50% drop to two. That's a modified actual scale. So this one is a better table to look at. This one will show you that both the MAS score, which has talked to us about spastic reduction, and also the modified Patel index, which has talked to us about the ADL function. So at three weeks, the group A with the Botox received under EMG was actually 58, about 10 points higher than group B doesn't have EMGs at all. And same thing, their modified actual score is less than one in the group B is about 1.3. And the changes remain almost the same at three months um, for both groups. So what that they conclude. They conclude that EMG guidance is more effective than manual needle placement alone in both spastic reduction, spasticity reduction, and also in functional improvement. 
and they found that in six patients of group A, by using EMG, they can actually say, oh, this muscle is more spastic than the other muscle. They're able to adjust the dosage. They're able to reduce the dosage, the total amount of Botox using about 220. Limitation, again, small sample size, They're only 27 patients. And other limitations, they use an orthopedic surgeon to perform injection, not a pulmonary physician. So orthopedic surgeon, they may have better anatomy skills than us. Maybe that's why they minimize the mistakes. So the next one we're going to look at today is electrical stimulation guidance. Uh, those that rotate through TBI, you see uh, TBI attending do this a lot. They do a lot of like fennel block using electrical stimulation in the musculocutaneous nerve. Dr. Siegel is one of the fan of electrical stimulation. It's another popular tool for muscle localization. So basically, you find the target muscle by, by anatomical landmark, and then you insert the needle, you deliver a stimulus, about 5M, just to get something. When you get the contraction of the muscles, then you go deeper, you localize the motor end plate. The way you can find out you are close to the motor end plate is when you reduce the intensity of the stimulus to about 1M or even less than 1M, you can still maintain the contraction. The difference between electrical stimulation and EMG is that electrical stimulation can give you a visible muscle contraction, what EMG doesn't. EMG, you only listen to the noise, you only see the MUAP, but electrical stimulation will verify that you are in the target muscle because you can actually see the visible twitch of that muscle. That's the difference between electrical stimulation and EMG. Again, disadvantage, you're poking the patients around, you can create a lot of discomfort, and also giving a stimulus to the patient can also create discomfort for the patient, time consuming, of course, you need training for that. Um, so there's one study by Dr. Pacelli in um, Italy. He looked at uh, 81 chronic stroke patients with spastic Aquinas foot. So the way he does that, he inject four, four times, two times in the middle gas drop and two times in lateral gas drop of 81. So he, you look at about 320 injections he evaluated. So two injection in medial gas drop, one deliver at proximal site. The proximal is described as close to the muscle origin. And the distal site of the injection is close to the, the muscle belly, the mid belly. And the exclusion criteria, of course, they exclude all the fixed contractures of bony deformities. The accuracy of the injection and also muscle thickness is verified by using ultrasound. There's only one physician performed the injection, and one physician with more than four years of experience in MSK ultrasound did the, ver did the verification. Um, so result, the table is a bit too big, so I would just summarize the table for you guys. So what the result they found? Two things to remember about this is one, into the middle gas trucks, regardless if you use electrical stimulation or manual needle placement into the medial gas drop, your success rate is in about 88 to 92%. So regardless, if you use electrical stimulation, you get 92%. If you use MNP, you get 88%, almost the same. And regardless if you do in the proximal location or distal location, your success rate is almost equal for both methods. However, in the lateral gas drop, they found that the electrical stimulation in the 87 to 92% compared to the MNP is about 60 to 70%. So, and the 73% is distal site, 92% is distal site, 87 and 64 proximal site, respectively. So they advise us that for the medial gas drop, you can just get away doing MNP only. You don't need electrical stimulation because the success rate is the same for both groups. For the lateral gas drop, however, they recommend you should use electrical stimulation because with MNP alone, you only can get up about 70%, 64%. With the electrical stimulation, we'll boost it up to about 90, 30% uh, higher. So, the, uh, However, they conclude that because they use ultrasound to verify the accuracy of these injections, they feel that ultrasound is one of the most accurate methods in performing Botox injection. Um, limitation, of course, they use different kinds of population, uh, about 10 people have less than two years from stroke, majority of more than two years out of stroke. Why is it important? Because 
the longer you are from stroke, the muscles architecture can be changed compared to people younger from stroke. So those can change in your clinical effects also. And again, one physician does all the injection versus a cohort of physician. So this physician like have more than three years or five years experience injecting all day long. That's all they do. Does that apply to all physicians out there? I don't know. And again, they choose the gastroc me medius muscles as, as a muscle for accuracy. It's not that great muscle to choose because it's large, it's superficial. You know that you're going to get it. So lastly, we're going to talk about ultrasound guidance. So we all know about ultrasound from the MSK. We all learn about the ultrasound going to the MSK from the beginning, and now it starts going to a spine. A lot of people talk about pain doing spine, talk about doing ultrasound, and now it's going to stroke. So ultrasound guidance, as you can see, that it's a real time. You can see the needle where you're going. Um, you can avoid puncturing the vessels. You can avoid puncturing the nerve. Um, the one statement I put it here that I'm not sure if it's correct. I said we use potential Botox spread to the out to the other muscles nearby by precise visualizing of target muscle. The only that statement I got from a literature review, I did not see any RCT to prove that for real. All right, so it's only from a conclusion of uh, the review study that I read. So I'm not sure if it, that is. Is, is, is correct right there. Um, of course, ultrasound requires a lot of training and a lot of comfort. Uh, you have to be comfort with the procedure to perform. Um, so here, we'll look at two studies in the United States. I put uh, Dr. Shikara and Dr. Peter, Peter on there. Uh, so this study was done at Mayo Clinic uh, in the Pimanar department. So, uh, Dr. Shahara is young, right? He's handsome, but he's in Hawaii right now, so he doesn't know that I talk about him. <laughs> so, uh, they, <laughs> so they picked two physicians. One is attending physician, and one is resident. So I picked Peter as the representative of third year class. Um, so each person will will um, will do two fine. So this is the why of the use. So this is the Y with the hook at the end. So each person will do two shots, two, two fine line into 14 lower limb cardiac muscles. So Dr. Shihara would do 28 injection in one limb with MNP and 28 injection in the um, other limb with the ultrasound. Peter would do the same thing. So they look at 112 injection total. And forget about anatomical dissection, forget about using using anatomist orthopedic surgeon to dissect and to verify the accuracy, forget that. They said, you know what, let's put all the cadaver in the PET scan to see where the muscle they hook at. So that's what they're going to verify it. So they said, after you consider the wire going deep, it's about five millimeters into the target. As long as the PET scan verified it, they're okay. That's correct. Incorrect, you puncture something else. Vessels, do not into the target muscles. So what is they found? Sorry, it's tied up, like, out of control. I don't know why it's like that. So basically, it's like a shifting, and I don't know why it's like. So basically, the ultrasound group, everybody get 444, except into the semi tenosis. Four try is only two that correct. That's the only muscle they got it wrong. That's all you remember then. Versus the non guided group is on the left corner. You see like four try, and only one try correct for the long head, the bicep, the morris. And for the flexor house of lung, there's four try, only one try is correct. Same thing for first dorsal interosis of the foot, four try and doesn't go anywhere. So, um, so what did they find? So this table would just show you that where are the errors? So for the muscle rector femoris, the error is actually found in the vastus intermediate. For the semi tenosis, the star is the ultrasound group. They go into semi membranosis. Or popliteus muscle, they go into the popliteal arteries and veins um, and set to the muscle they wanted it. So here's the picture, some cascan pictures. The overall result is that 39% accuracy rate with the MNP versus 96% with the ultrasound. And the P value pretty impressive, less than 0 0.001. And of course, the experienced physician, Dr. Shihara, 
using the MNP, 82% versus Peter, only 50%. And I don't think Dr. Shihara would be happy with 82%. He'd probably say, I always get 102. But I think 82% is, is not, is underestimate his, um, his skill. So the pictures on the left, it shows you that they target into the gracilis and they into the gracilis. The picture on the right, they want to go into the TBS posterior, but they pass it and they go into the peronus previs. Um, so what the conclusion is that the use of ultrasound, of course, shows significantly improved in accuracy in the cadaver lower limb muscles. Um, again, the small sample size, they use cadavers, I explained earlier, they don't have tone. Uh, they, they, it's not similar to the real life patients. And one thing about the study that they select muscles that may rarely need it for injection, like popliteus, how often we inject popliteus muscle? Very rare. We never inject popliteus muscle. Mm -hmm. They select muscles like that. So obviously that you're going to be wrong because you barely inject that all the time in your life. Or muscle that really need ultrasound guidance. TBS anterior is very easy to feel. You may not even need ultrasounds at all. Of course, if you do four chart with ultrasound or four chart with MNP, you're going to get it because it's so obvious for you to see. And you should, they should study the most appropriate muscle for ultrasound, such as the diaphragm. A lot of time we got constant of patient that's not able to extubate. They should do the diaphragm because it's critical, it's important. Or even chest bone muscles like the rhomboid, the serratus anterior. You see that in a lot of cases with Dr. Shihara. He do a lot of those muscles. If the patient have like um, scapular protraction, those are relevant to the clinical practice. They did not look into those. So the last study in ultrasound we look at today is by Dr. Hansel and associate. This study will carry out at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, this study is interesting. It actually makes you think, what happened to all the anatomical landmark that you learn in EMG? Are they really correct? Or they are not really correct? So, <laughs> so it, it's kind of, it's a very interesting study and I think it's good. <laughs> In a way, and if you hate EMG, it's like, you know what, screw this. I don't learn all these anatomical landmarks. So this study is actually looking at 18 patients with upper limb specificity <laughs> secondary to stroke or TBI. One thing I want to point out, these patients are seven years away from stroke. So if they're seven years away from stroke, the muscle is like atrophy. They develop fat fibrosis. That's why I said earlier, anatomic landmark is not good for these chronic stroke patients that develop all the changes in their muscles, especially in the upper limb versus the lower limb. So they actually look into the, they check the accuracy of MNP into the flexopause longus, FCR, the parietaries, and into the FDS. Um, so at first, they use the MNP, they mark the skin, they remove it all off, and they actually use the ultrasound to verify the optimal injection site. The optimal injection site is described as the portion of the target muscle with the largest cross-sectional diameter. So just for you to keep, to keep with all these landmarks for you to easy to follow with the, the, the study here. So they use the landmark line, it's come from medial epicondyle to the epiciform. And that landmark line is from A to B, is classified as 100%, all right? So the proximal distal coordinate, so they find the biggest area of the muscle. From that point on, the proximal to distal coordinate is how much percentage from that landmark line. And from that corner, they measure the right angle, they will give them the lateral coordinate. That's what the muscle they locate at. So here we go. So the, just look at the one that I, I, yellowed, I highlighted yellow. So where you can see that in the proximal distal coordinate measure in centimeter, all the FDS, the no change is off in the proximal distal. The mapping <clears> and the ultrasound, <throat> no change, the white one. However, in the FCR, it's almost one centimeter different in the proximal di distal. Pronator teres is huge. It's almost twice, 4.7 to 9.4, and the p-value is 0 0.003. Pretty significant. And the flexopause is longest, of course, about one centimeter more distal. And the p-value is also high, p of 0.42. So according to the study, p less than 
0 0.05 is considered significant. So you can see that the proximal distal distance, the periteri is a little bit far off compared to the anatomical landmarks in these patients. And same thing here. Uh, the table show the lateral coordinate, how far they are from their landmark line. The FDS2 is significant, it's almost one and a half point extra. The FDS3 is almost two point extra, two millimeter extra far lateral. The FDS2 almost the same thing, 1.8. And the FCR, look at the FCR, 32 versus 21, lateral coordinate. So they conclude that for pronated teres by the ultrasound, they actually locate very laterally near the insertion of one third of forearm compared to anatomical landmark. So anatomical landmarks say that you using the elbow crease, two finger breadth down, you should see the bulk of the muscles, right? But according to ultrasound, it's actually further down and it's actually close to the insertion. So again, these are not real, there's not like a normal patient, these are chronic stroke patients. So whether or not the anatomical landmark is good for these chronic stroke patients, we're not sure. Mm -hmm. Because obviously the landmark changes here. We don't see that consistent. Mm -hmm. And same thing with the FCR, you said, okay, elbow crease, forefinger breadth down. However, the FCR by ultrasound located slightly more distal and laterally than it's supposed to be. <laughs> So here we are in the FPLs and also FDS. They found that the FPL location by ultrasound is also distal than the middle forearm as suggested by anatomical landmark. So the one on your left is the ultrasound. The one on your right is anatomical landmark. Right. And the FDS belly, I said the proximal distal is not really changed. However, the lateral corner is significant for the FDS to the digit number three and to digit number two. So this one just throw in for ultrasound picture for whoever loved the ultrasound here just to say that they are great people. They actually, to look like FDS4, they actually look like FDS4, <laughs> they will just show that the, the injecting and you can see the blush of the injection in the background. Um, and they said you can able to accomplish that with the ultrasound to visualize different fascicles of the ultrasound. Um, so Hansel, what are their conclusions? Their conclusion that surface landmark was based on a cadaver study may not be great for chronic stroke patients because in stroke patients, you have atrophy developed, fat fibrosis, and hypertrophy. And of course, you can't lay these patients in the supination, in the anatomical landmark you want it to be. So these are difficult for them. And plus, uh, they, they mention here, cadaver study can be such dehydration, alter tissue silences. So those are discrepancy. And maybe that's why they see changes. And they suggest that we should use ultrasound as an adjunct for muscle localization. Of course, if whoever want to interest in this, it, you take about five to 10 minutes extra <clears throat> beside your usual, uh, which is I said five, 10 minutes extra. I don't think that none of us can do that five, 10 minutes because these guys are doing all the time. They can do it in five, 10 minutes. But for us, probably take a while um, for do ultrasound. So let's pause for a second. So what MNP, we beat to death that MNP is inferior to all of these techniques, right? We know that all cadaver studies, everything would beat to death that concept. MNP is inferior to all the four methods in terms of localizing spastic muscles. Medo gastro, if you're busy in your clinics and stuff like that, you can get away. You're doing manual manipulation, your chance of getting to it, 92% regardless. For small, deep overlapping muscles at the forearm, your bet bet, just take your ultrasound machine and just do it. Just don't debate like, oh, I'm going to get with EMG. I'm going to get electrical stimulation. The trend is, well, if you have a chronic stroke patient present to you, these landmarks may not even work for them. So the second part of a study, they look at the different clinical outcomes based on the injection method. So we have all these four methods. Are there any one better than the others in terms of clinical outcomes? So for the past decades, stroke literature is very, very slow. There's not much study. Uh, Dr. Mayer here at Moss Rehab conducting a 2008 study. And uh, of course, Dr. Pacelli is a research in Italy. He did two studies in 2012 and 2014. So let's look at Dr. Mayer study. This study is interesting in a way that, this picture, by the way, from the cadaver study, 
So for you guys to know that, what you guys think about the motor input? You, we always think the motor input is at the bulk of the muscles, right? It is where you actually is. This could have a study say that no, the motor input is the V band. This V band here is actually one third distal from the bicep. It's not actually at the <clears throat> bulk of the muscles at all. So this picture was just a demonstration of what Dr. May is going to do, but that's not Dr. May's study, just for you to know. All right. So don't misunderstand that all of these landmarks that we have, the bulk of the muscle may not necessarily is the highest concentration of the motor input. Different muscles, different patients, the motor input can be changed as example to the study. So in Dr. Mayer, he actually looked at 31 adult stroke patients, adult 21 TBI, 8 the stroke, and 2 the hypothesis encephalopathy. Um, they have actual scores of 3. He divided the group into two groups. One group received single motor point injection. This is what he injects, one single point into the motor end zone, the first group. The second group, he do the quadrant, what he called the distributed. He do in four quadrants of the bicep. The study conducted the bicep and the brachialis. Only two muscle was got selected. And that's a group one. Group two received in the four quadrants. So group one receiving one more, one point in the motor end plate, as I show you in the V band, and one receiving all four quadrants. What did he find? There's no change at all. In both groups, the, the actual score from three to two, TCA score from 102 to 74 to 7, same. And same thing, the EMG finding, almost the same for both groups. There's no change. Either you do one point injection into the motor end plate or you do in different four quadrants. There's no change in either technique. What's interesting about the study is that the brachialis, he did not inject the brachialis. So why does the brachialis change? He did not inject the brachialis. He injecting the bicep and he injecting the brachial radialis. But why the bicep change, uh, the brachial radialis change in this scenario? So the way he explained is that because he do the four quadrant distribution, the Botox can be spread to that muscle. So they actually diffuse out. So they have neighboring effect. So just to prove that Botox can spread to different, to, diff, to local, to nearby muscles. So what he's concluded, as I mentioned already, there's no change, no difference between single motor point injection in a motor end plate versus a multi-point injection into different quadrants, there's no change at all in a similar clinical outcome. And again, as so I said, limitations spread of the toxin and diffusion mechanisms are unknown because the brachialis did show the effect, which he did not inject the brachialis. And the other limitation that he did not hold any medication on these patients, they all they still take the same medication, the antispastic medication, pre and post Botox, whether or not they actually have any effect on the final outcome he said he doesn't know and the last thing here that he used surface emg as a measure may not be a good thing because as i said you can pick up the signal from a nearby muscles that may not be the study but may not be the muscle of, of what you study for so this study is here we have two more studies to go through dr Paselli look at the diff three different groups one group is MNP, one group is ES, and one group is ultrasound into the 47 patient with spastic foot. And what did he found? He found that the ultrasound group is actually better only in ankle passive range of motion. Here, 0 0.01, 0 0.04 is significant. That the ultrasound better than the MNP and, and, and electrical stimulation and ankle passive range of motion. <coughs> Other than that, there's nothing else difference at all. And within group comparison, as I show here, every single group you see the, dip, the decrease in either MAS, Tadu scale, or ankle passive range of motion, H group. So the study limitation, they did not look into the gait in analysis in these patients. Again, you can reduce how much tone you want, but does it change anything in the patient's functional gait? The study did not look at it. That's important, right? Because you can change the tone, but can they walk? We don't know that. And they did not look into the EMG guidance as one of the comparison. They only look at three other methods. 
So his last study is in about upper limb, 60 chronic stroke patient. He divided into three different groups also, MNP, ES, and also ultrasound. And you can see that I highlight the one, the ES and ultrasound are better than the MNP in every single test measure. MNP versus ES and ultrasound are better than MNP in every single one. Modify actual at the breast, modify actual scales at the fingers, and also at the Tadu scale angles of the fingers, also at the wrist, and also the wrist passive range of motion, both ultrasound and ES did much better than MNP. And here's the conclusion as I speak, and limitation, again, there's only one physician who do all the injection. They did not look into any kind of like ADLs, functional assessment for these patients. Um, so in summary of my talk, small sample size, all these studies, less than 100 patients, they fail to look at functional outcome as one of the test measures. You can look at the modified actual scale. You can decrease very subjective. And a lot of the time, the MAS score is actually involved both neural and non-neural component. And of course, we know that MNP is inferior to the other method in localizing spastic muscles in hemiplegic patients. We need larger randomized controlled trial, of course, to compare all these methods with functional outcome. We need some sort of functional outcome, which uh, as a physical medicine attending, we want to see that. And we need to see EMG versus EF versus ultrasound. We don't need to see MNP again, because we already know MNP is inferior to all of these. We only want to see EMG versus EF versus ultrasound. That's what we need to study. And we need, need to look into, one of the interesting things that I see in research now is study look at high density surface EMG guidance. What is high density surface EMG guidance? High density surface EMG guidance is actually in research. They actually, it's like, it's like a grid with thousands of electrodes put on the target muscle. So you actually can record that you see this. So I hope that it will come from research, the clinical um, side. So you can see in the far left, it's like a grid of like 120 electrodes, depends on what kind of muscle you study. If you study a larger muscle, you need higher amount of electrodes. So instead of using a needle to poking all the patient muscles, right, this one just apply the grid there. And the electrode will give you a recording of all the MDAP. The action potential is the one that actually retrograde away from motor amplitude which is, of course, when you have a contraction, motor amplitude, action potential will travel away from motor amplitude. That's how they record it. So they record it. The amplitude zone is somewhere between line number 11 and line number 12. It's not in the middle. It's line number 11 and 12. This is the EDB muscle, extensively trunk present muscle they look at. It's somewhere. Uh, so they found it, and they inject it, and what did they find? If you inject in the motor end plate zone, right, you know that the effect can last up to 24 weeks decrease in CMAP. I think a lot of second year may not understand what CMAP is, but CMAP is a compound muscle action potential. When you give a nerve electrical stimulation, you can record a compound muscle action potential. And the compound muscle action potential will tell you that you are, uh, it correlates with the motor end plate zone. Um, so they found that at two weeks, up until 24 weeks, if you focus on the amplitude zone, the effect of bone chalk can last up to 24 weeks, not just three months, six months. And they said that if you go away only two millimeters from the amplitude zone, only two millimeters from the amplitude zone, your CMAP reduction will drop from whatever the number you said I would, will drop 4.6%. So you talk about you going 12 millimeters, about 10, like about one centimeter you drop about like four, 46%. So the effect of Botox will actually drop 46% if you go one centimeter away from the motor amplitude zone. So this technique is actually been done only in research. It's having applied to stroke patient or any patient is only in normal population. And we hope that it may go into the clinical practice and helping out stroke patient instead of using the needles and anatomical landmarks which is can be changed in these cases. By using this, you just put the electro grid and you're recording a hundred of them and you can see all these 
action potential and you know that your endpoint zone and you just inject it there and you see the effect. And speaking of that, and I picked Feng to do this first question, but he's not here, which is where you know that if your patient flex wrists and clench fist, you should be choosing ultrasound. And when a stroke patient presents to you, this is a hard question, is you're going to do medial gas drops. <laughs> and that's it. So here's my references. And thank you for Dr. Moon. He's on vacation. He's not here. And Dr. Alipat for delicious breakfast. <laughs> Any questions? I guess that's it. What test? <laughs> I didn't study.